I'm Marty Stauffer. Now that we've grown up and live in different parts of the country, my sister and two brothers and I get along fine. In fact, my brothers sometimes give me a hand producing Wild America. But when we were kids, I have to admit, we had our share of fights, just like all families do, even animals. Baby animals often must compete with each other for whatever food their parents are able to provide. And sometimes these tussles are not all in fun. Such sibling disputes are valuable training lessons, teaching the young to fight for a place in the world. But squabbling is not limited to the early stages of life, nor do animals quarrel only with their own kind. Ironically, adults of closely related species compete more frequently and more intensely than do non-related ones. The crucial concerns of food, territory, and mating commonly provoke rivalries that can't be ignored. And it's not always a larger or more powerful cousin that wins. Let's examine the reasons for and the resolutions of these animal arguments and see what side nature takes in a family feud. Competition has shaped the lives of wild animals for millions of years. It's the major force in evolution. The struggle for survival is not one long battle. It's a series of seemingly minor everyday skirmishes. It's autumn in the Rocky Mountains, and black bears compete with each other for both food and territory. These siblings spent a full year growing and learning in the company of their mother. She chased them off when she was ready to breed again last summer. They've been traveling together since then, but as adults, they will rarely tolerate other bears, even relatives. So it's time now for them to separate, each setting out alone to establish its own home range. This play fight is the bear's way of asserting independence. Each of them is saying goodbye, 
to the sibling that has shared its life for the past two and a half years. Each animal begins a new life of solitude, coming together with others of its kind only occasionally. They instinctively protect their food supply by spreading out. An individual home range of five to 25 square miles is necessary to supply enough food for a bear. West of the Rocky Mountains are the rocky shores of San Miguel Island. The island is 30 miles off the California coast and is the breeding ground of the elephant seal. They gather by the hundreds along the sandy beaches. In late winter, the females that were bred the season before give birth. And a month or so after that, they are bred again by the beach masters, the dominant males. The females don't have the male's enlarged proboscis, the distinctive nose that gives the species its name. Nor do they and their pups join in the fighting. Fights between the huge males are ritualistic and rarely fatal, but much blood will flow as the bulls, weighing six to eight thousand pounds apiece, slash away with sharp canine teeth at each other's tough, protective hide. Fights between two of the huge males may sometimes last for hours. But no matter how long they last, every fight affects the entire herd. Fights are not strictly for females, but rather more for status in the male hierarchy and position on the beach. Finally, the loser retreats to the edges of the breeding area while the winner declares his victory.
Meanwhile, on the eastern coast of our country, another great gathering takes place. These protected wetlands are the winter home of the tundra swan, formerly called the whistling swan. They've flown south from their Arctic nesting grounds to winter here with widgeons and other waterfowl on Maryland's eastern shore. There are many family groups made up of male and female which mate for life and their signets from the previous spring. Male swans chase each other around. The purpose of these inter-family feuds is to strengthen and renew the bonds between male and female. Along the Canadian border are vast stretches of the great north woods. Here in Minnesota, Superior National Forest is a final stronghold for our nation's few remaining timber wolves. Like the elephant seals, wolves also have a hierarchy. In fact, there are two, male and female. Each wolf has a place in its sex's social order, and accordingly, in the pack. Here, the dominant, or alpha female, on the right, begins to feed. Her mate, the alpha male, has already eaten. As pack leader, and since males generally outrank females, the alpha male takes the first step in any competitive situation. He usually remains unchallenged, except when another male, very closely related in rank, senses the chance to move up in the hierarchy. Such is the situation here. It's not a deadly fight. Both males are vital parts of the cohesive group, and later they must cooperate while hunting, if any of the pack is to survive. The alpha male reasserts his dominance by treating the subordinate as a female and symbolically mating with him. <laughs> Wolves are constantly defining and defending their places in the pack. Through such fighting, 
Each wolf always knows exactly where he or she stands within the social order. But what happens when two wild dogs of different species meet? Where the wolf has disappeared, the coyote has prospered. And on the plains of South Dakota, this wild dog is top dog. Because of competition for mice and other food, the coyote will not tolerate its smaller cousin, the red fox. Coyote is not the red fox's only enemy. Bobcats, bears, golden eagles, and men with dogs also pursue it. Still, the red fox survives and even moves into new areas every now and then. For when this bright little wild dog cannot outwit its foes, it can always outrun them. For now, the coyote holds the claim to these hunting grounds. But it's not always the larger or more powerful cousin that wins. Consider, for example, two members of the weasel family which live in Montana. The feisty little badger is the ground-hugging earth mover of the clan. Its larger cousin, the wolverine, is not exactly famous for its pleasant disposition either. This mother and her cub will part soon when the yearling leaves to live alone. The badger smells the wolverines in its territory. And the female wolverine is aware of the badger too. The female wolverine stands up in an attempt to see what she senses. She moves in closer and in the typical galloping gait of the wolverine begins tracking the badger. The female faces down the badger alone while her cub lags behind. 
but the youngster soon catches up and joins her in the attack on their smaller cousin. Seeking protection, the badger makes a stand between the rocks. As yet an unskilled fighter, the youngster stays back on the sidelines. The badger's loose skin prevents the wolverines from grabbing onto its body. Like any animal fighting on its own territory, the badger is more forceful than the invading wolverine. In any situation, few can best the badger, with its long claws and sharp teeth, and with a body so low that an enemy cannot move in effectively. The wolverines had less at stake all along, and so they move away and resume their lives of restless wandering. But the badger gets the last growl and the right to live and hunt one more day. This is Lake McDonald in Glacier National Park, Montana. Here, the ranges of two wild cats narrowly overlap, as do their food preferences at times. Overlapping ranges often result in problems for closely related species. The wild cat of the north is the lynx. To cope with deep snow, it has wide, heavily furred paws, long legs, and a thick fur coat. No other member of its family is as well adapted for a life of long, cold winters. The cougar is an occasional visitor to these woods. It normally lives at lower elevations where its favorite food is deer. The lynx can live at higher elevations and farther north because of one very important prey animal, prey that the cougar will sometimes also hunt, the snowshoe hare.
Only one in five chases ends with a catch. So the lynx instinctively knows when to stop expending precious energy. As it stops to rest, it's a little less alert than it should be. But the hungry cougar is just beginning to hunt. The lynx, although smaller, has successfully defended its territory. As the snow gets deeper, the cougar will be forced down into lower country. The lynx will stay in its forest home, proving once again that it's not always the larger or more powerful cousin that wins. Most animal arguments result from competition, especially for territory and food. Unfortunately, man is often a direct factor in these quarrels. As we use up more and more of our wilderness, the pressures on wildlife are increased. Now, wild animals can't be crowded together into artificial towns and cities like we humans. And since only a certain number of them can exist harmoniously within a given natural area, the chances are that, as this area shrinks, unfriendly encounters between close cousins will increase. So keep in mind that by supporting habitat conservation, each of us can help to prevent a family feud. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.